So um, at, at some point in your life, right, we've, uh, we've encountered this question or you've encountered someone who has asked you a question. It's one of those ridiculous, unanswerable questions. So like, here's one for an example. Uh, you, maybe someone's asked you this before. Can, can God create a rock so big that he can't pick it up? Now, they're unanswerable, right? They're ridiculous in nature because we know that it, if you say, well, well, yeah, of course God can make a rock that big. So he can make one so big that he can't pick it up. Then it limits his powers and his abilities to be strong enough to pick up the rock. But then on the other hand, if you say, well, no, he can't create the rock, then it speaks to the limited power that he has in, in an ability to create. So it's just kind of one of those ridiculous questions. But we all know that the all-time standard for crazy questions and the most unanswerable question is, is one that we've heard since we were a kid, right? What came first? Thank you. What came first, the chicken or the what? Does anybody know the answer? I actually heard um, recently, I actually saw a guy who took a pretty good stab at it, and I think we, we may wait to hear. He actually posted a picture. And in the picture that he posted on Instagram, it was a picture of an order from Amazon and he ordered a chicken and an egg and he said he would let us know. Now, I have no idea. I have no idea how that worked out and how it turned out. I never did follow through on that. But uh, what, one thing that I do want you to know is that um, the point in Paul's letter to the church at Rome up to this point, he has spent a lot of time speaking uh, in these first four chapters to this Jewish audience. And the reason that he has spent the time talking to them um, is he's been uh, focusing on a man named Abraham who is known to them as the father of the faith. Now he's, he spent a lot of time here and he's talking about Abraham and how he was declared righteous because he believed God. That he was not righteous because of his adherence to the law. He was not uh, declared righteous for any other reason that, that he just simply believe God. In the previous section of this letter, Paul has uh, spent time contrasting faith and works. He, he needed to address this because the Jews were hyper-focused on the performance side of their faith. They were uh, focused on people jumping through all of these spiritual hoops in order to be justified. You guys kind of know what I'm talking about. I mean, when we kind of grew up in church, there were all these things that you felt like that you needed to do in order to have experienced the love of God and to be saved. And it is, it's tough because we try to figure out like how in the world do we navigate our way through all of these things? And so Paul's writing to them and, and these, again, these men, they insisted certain things. They said, hey, listen, if you're going to be saved, there's some things that you have to do, even if you're not Jewish. They were beginning to insist that even non-Jewish people, they said that you have to be circumcised, that, that people had to obey the laws of God and that they had to make sacrifices in order to acquire salvation. There were all these little things. And then Paul's having to address this as he writes this letter to the church at Rome. Now, before we before we kind of think about them in the context of all these things that they felt like and were teaching others that they had to jump through in order to be saved, um, what they began to, what he, the reason he had to address it is um, for these reasons. But before we look down on them, we have, to, um, we have to understand that we have some kind of crazy beliefs of our own. I mean, and I'm talking about within the big C church, right? I mean, there are, there are some there are some sections of Christianity that they believe that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, not understanding that baptism is just simply uh, an outward reflection of what has taken place in your life internally. That was kind of the whole thing behind uh, his argument with circumcision. Some believe that you have to be able to speak in tongues in order to show that you're saved. That if you're really saved, there are groups of Christianity that believe if you're really saved that you'll be able to speak in tongues. There are um, some that believe that you must, if you ever watch TV, if you ever listen to any secular music, that you're just not going to be saved, right? Like there, there are people that believe that strictly, that there are things that we can do that can cause us to lose our salvation. And it would even appear that there are some who believe that if you don't make it to church, at least on Easter and Christmas, that you're going to the bad place. You know what I mean? We have some crazy beliefs as well. And so in our text today, Paul is going to attempt to help these people understand the connection. And it's really important for us because there's a connection that's going to be made today. And, and maybe this is a connection that you've tried to figure out for years. And this is why this was so difficult. And I, I, again, please pray for me as I, I kind of journey through this because I want to explain it well because it's so important. And Paul is going to make this connection between the promises of God which are very important, we sang about a few minutes ago. 
He's going to make a connection between the promises of God and the law of God and, and faith, and what we believe and how we believe. He's going to make that connection for us. And so um, as he does this, he's going to do it through the life of Abraham. Again, this is where he's been for the last little bit. So why Abraham? Because Abraham is known as the father of faith. He is the first one that God initiated a faith contract with. He is the prototype of what faith in Christ and salvation should look like. So what does saving faith look like? When it comes to receiving the promises of God, what comes first? Obedience or belief? And that's a huge, huge deal. Because it's like, we, we want to go, we, we tend to go to one side or the other. We tend to stray to one extreme or the other. It's like, well, we've got to do all these things to obey God. But then on the other side, there's people that go, well, all you have to do is believe. Well, these are, these are some things that we probably ought to have some confidence in. We should be able to figure out how these two things go together. So what comes first? Obedience or faith? Faith? Or obedience. Well, this is an easy one, right? This is a slam dunk. And the reason this is a slam dunk, we think, is because last week you, we just read from Romans chapter 4, verse 3. And here's what Romans 4, verse 3 said. So just last week we talked about this. For the scripture, uh, for what does the scripture say? Abraham what? It, he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So evidently the answer is you just have to believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on a cross, that God raised him from the dead. That's what we're getting ready to celebrate here at Easter in a few weeks. And if you believe, then we can be like Abraham and we'll get credited to our account righteousness. Seems pretty easy. Seems like a slam dunk. Well, since it was that easy, uh, the sermon is over. Let's um, kind of close our Bibles. We'll close in prayer. We'll get the team up here. We'll all go home early and you'll get to eat an early lunch. And we know that's not true, right? Before we can um, go any further, before we can ponder what Paul is going to say here in Romans chapter 4, we need to look at the words of James, James being the half-brother of Jesus. So if, if we see Paul write in Romans that, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, well, then we see over here in James chapter 2, verse 21, here's what he says, was not Abraham our father justified by what? when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. Verse 22, he says, you see that faith was active along with his works and that faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified. Um, you see that a person is justified by works and not by what? Faith alone. So there's this, um, there's this beautiful dance that's taking place between Faith and works. Faith and works. So what comes first? What comes first and what is the most important? What's more important? What is the thing that really kind of seals the deal for us and our relationship with God? What is that? The Bible seems to indicate that all you have to do is believe on one hand, right? I mean, we saw what he said about Abraham and his belief and it was credited to him as righteousness. We know that John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world that whoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. So we see this, but, but then we also see passages like we just saw and read in James. And what we're going to see today through Paul is that Abraham, or about Abraham, is that there's this, again, there's this beautiful dance that exists between, the, between believing and obeying. And I, I hope, again, that I can make this very difficult passage um, understandable for us all. So here we go. Romans chapter four, beginning in verse 13, it says the promise for the, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs. Faith, he says, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also 
to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So now at this point, we're probably feeling a lot like the people did in the recipients of the letter. I mean, just a little bit confused. So which one is it? Is it faith? Is it obedience? I mean, which one? I mean, kind of confused, right? This, this whole conversation, this whole topic to me sounds confusing, seems confusing because again, we see that it's belief and then we kind of hear that it's also obedience and it's doing, it's what we do. So what is the deal? Kind of confused like the first time, you know what I'm talking about, guys? Uh, the first time your wife, um, the first time your wife told you that she was fine and you believed her. You know that kind of confused? Like, wait a minute, I thought... I thought you said you were fine. That doesn't mean she's fine, right? We all know that. Uh, confused like when we turn on the news and we see what's going on in the world and we see one news channel say one thing and the other news channel say the complete opposite and we're trying to figure out how does that make sense because one says one, one says the other. Confused, kind of like a squirrel. You know what I mean? The, you ever drive down the road and you see the squirrel, he runs out in the middle of the road and then he can't decide which way is the best route of escape and so he just dances back and forth until you hit him. Because it would appear in these passages that Paul is teaching that it has nothing to do with obedience to the law. It has nothing to do with obedience and it's 100% correct because Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and it was done so before the law was ever written. There was no, there was no Ten Commandments. There was no law in place when God spoke to Abraham. But that does not mean belief and obedience are not tied together. Before we go any further, um, <clears throat> a quick recap on Abraham. If you're not familiar with the Bible story, Abraham at the age of 75 is spoken to by God. He's just kind of hanging out, chilling in his tent one day, you know, um, hanging out. And all of a sudden God begins to speak and God says, Abraham, he says, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. Doesn't even give him the location, doesn't give him the GPS coordinates. He just says, I want you to go to a place that I will show you. And it says that, um, and he says, if you do this, here's the agreement that I'm gonna make you a great nation. At this point, at 75 years old, he and his wife had no children. He says, but I'm gonna make you a great nation. In other words, you're gonna have all of these descendants. He says, go outside, count the stars, see if you can number them. That's how many your descendants will be. And so Abraham believes God, trusts God, packs up his family, starts heading to a place that he has no idea where he's going, and he just walks. In the, and he walks in the faithfulness of the teaching of God, and he believes God, and it is credited to him as righteousness. And here's the amazing thing. So what would, what would get a man to do that? What would lead a person to believe that, you know what, if I just... If I just believe, like God has spoken to me and I don't know where I'm going, I'm just gonna get up and I'm gonna pack my family up. Like, hey babe, I don't know where we're going, but if you'll just pack all of our clothes, we'll get together, we'll pack our clothes, we'll load them up on the back of the camel and we'll just, we'll just start caravanning somewhere. I have no idea where we're going. And they do. What would cause a person to do that? And it's this thing called hope that in this moment that God spoke to him, hope filled his heart. And he says, and I don't know, I don't know where we're going and I don't know what this thing's gonna look like, but, but I know God has spoken and because God has spoken, my heart is full of hope. Have you ever been so full of hope that, uh, man, you just started dancing in your house? Wrong crowd, Baptists don't dance, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you ever been so full of hope that you just started, like you just started singing and you can't sing? Right? Like you, you, your voice doesn't even sound good, but you just said, you know, I'm gonna start singing. I, I'm, I'm so excited that I just can't hide it. You know what I'm talking, like, and, and you get so excited, you're so full of hope that it's almost like all the, the blood rushes to your face and, and your feet begin to move a little bit and your mouth begins to move a little bit and, and it, you almost get that kind of warm, fuzzy, tingly feeling like you're so full of hope, you're so excited. Like that moment when your baby was born. Now you were full of hope for all of about 10 minutes after that, it was kind of downhill, you know what I mean? Or that, that hope that you had when you prayed for that job that you worked so hard for and you got that phone call and they said, hey, we just wanna let you know, you're our guy, you're our woman, you got the job. 
we believe in you and we believe that you're going to get this thing done. And behind you, we're going to we're going to accomplish so many great things. That hope that you felt when you received that phone call or or how about the hope that you felt? Remember this one, guys, the moment the doors opened and there she was in that white dress and she began walking down the aisle and man, hope filled your heart. And you're like, man, I get to spend the rest of my life with her. That kind of hope. That hope that you felt that the hope in your heart is so full and it's so big that there's nothing that world could do in that moment to make you feel bad. Or how about this one? The hope that you had when you got the clean bill of health from the doctor. You had taken some tests, you had some concerns, you had some worries. Maybe you had been through some stuff and you'd had already had some procedures and then one day you get to ring the bell or you get the phone call that says, hey, all things are clear, all things are good. That hope that you felt in your heart. Or how about the hope you felt in your heart the day that you surrendered your life to Jesus or your wife or your spouse, your husband surrendered their life to Jesus or your kids surrendered their life to Jesus and you with hope full in your heart sat there and watched as they were baptized in a baptistry. That kind of hope. But I I know that, um, you know, hope has kind of this, there's this, it's a double-sided coin, isn't it? Because we know that on one side of, The other side of the coin of hope is despair. Here's the thing. You can't really have hope without having a need for hope. You can't have hope without knowing that there are situations that exist where hope is needed because you are in a moment of despair and you know that things are hard and things are hurting. And so you are in need of hope. Have you ever been so empty of hope that you would have done anything to even have the faintest hint of hope? I remember um, when Coach Nobles was diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer. Tough day. Bill Bars, remember, uh, he told the team right before we got on a bus to go to Berrien County to play a football game, which at the moment seemed absolutely meaningless. And I remember uh, a few days later, because they, they had pretty much told him that there's no shot, there's no chance, there's nothing that, that we can do. Just a few weeks later, he had a conversation with a doctor. And the doctor said, hey, you know what, I, I think we might be able to try something. And I remember the day Buddy called me and he called me and and he had this faintest hint of hope in his heart. He went from hopeless to, I got just a little. And I remember he he quoted the great theologian uh, Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber when he said, so you're telling me there's a chance, right? But here's what we know about people who have no hope or Hope has been diminished and decreased in their life. Like their heart has just leaked hope altogether. We know that um, people who are desperate will do desperate things, won't they? And we've been around some. We may even have been some of those people. We've been desperate for God. God, I just need an ounce of hope today. If you could just give me a little. And people, when they get in desperate situations, you know what they do? They jump into things that are harmful and hurtful. They, when there's no hope, And they go, it's not that I don't believe in God, but I'm just not seeing God move. And so they jump into things. And sometimes people jump into addictions and it's hard to watch. Sometimes people begin to cheat, cheat on their taxes, try to cut corners, cheat on things that that will help them get to where they want, cheat on a test because you didn't study and God's not answering your prayer to just download that straight into you. Sometimes people give up and that's a horrible thing to see. They give up on all kinds of things. They give up on each other. They give up on God. They give up on the people that are closest to them. They give up on family. They give up on themselves. And then when desperation gets to an ultimate level, one of the unfortunate things that we see in our world today is we see people suffering greatly from depression. And then we see people take their own lives. And it's a terrible place to be. You know, I've talked with numerous people who have suffered with depression and and the, the voices in their head, the things that they constantly have to deal with, the darkness and coldness that they consistently feel, it's an awful, awful thing. And, and the crazy thing is, is you would think that it would lead to a place where they go, you know what, I need some help, so I'm going to go find somebody that would lead me to help. But you know what depressed people do? They retreat. They go hide in a room. They go close the door off from other people who actually will help them. And by the way, not just from a conversational standpoint, but you know, being around people and being with people actually energizes us. It actually is the reason that God looked down on Adam in the garden and said, it's not good that man should be alone. 
So if you're here today and your hope tank is low, maybe even, maybe even empty, I want you to know that, that we have a very real God who very much loves you and he really does want to give you life and he wants to give you hope. In Romans 15, 13, this will be something that we'll cover more in depth later, but I just love what the Apostle Paul writes. Listen to this in 15, 13. Um, he says that may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit may, may um, so that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I pray that God would fill you today with all hope and all joy so that your heart would be full that your dependency would not be on something, your circumstances. It would not be on maybe someone you feel has let you down, but it would be firmly planted in the hope and the faithfulness of God. In Romans 4, 17, listen to what Paul continues in saying. He says, as it is written, so this is, remember, Abraham's situation, 75 years old, no kids. God says, go. Abraham believes by faith. And then what we see here is that Abraham um, as after he goes, Paul says he was the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. Is that not beautiful? I mean, that, that Abraham, 75 years old, Abraham's like, God, I, I don't, I mean, most of us would be like, God, I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm 75. She's 75. I'm not supposed to tell her age, God, but you know all things. And like, God, this is kind of past the stages of even the possibility of you even working in this. And, and I love that Paul records here that there is a God in whom Abraham believed who gives life to the dead, and he calls into existence the things that do not even exist. I mean, what's dead in your heart today? What's dead in your heart? God is in the business of giving life to dead things. Did you know that? That God can speak into your life, he can speak into your heart, and he can waken things that are dead. See, you thought that thing was dead, you thought that thing was past the age of God even rescuing, and God is saying to you, he says, listen, I am the God who speaks dead things to life. I am the God who can speak things that don't even exist into existence. You need to have hope today. And a lot of you are looking at me today like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no hope. No, no, no. God, do you believe that there is a God that you serve, that you believe in? There's a God in the Bible who is the restorer of hope. Do you believe that? Okay, there are four of you who believe that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the four of you small group leaders, and we're going to break everybody else up into groups, and we're going to let you gather around someone who believes so that you may be encouraged in your faith journey. Listen, if you're not dead, God's not done. For he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If things are not going well, it means that God is not done working in your life. Abraham and Sarah were physically dead in their ability to reproduce, and yet God calls them to bear children. Like, come on. And he can give life to your dead hopes. He can give, he can breathe into existence things that you didn't even know were possible. For eye has not seen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. God's got some big things still in store for you. Just listen, just because your retirement age doesn't mean God still can't use you and doesn't mean that God doesn't want to use you. There is no such thing as retirement when it comes to the faith journey. God has some, I, you guys know who Dan Cathy is? Okay. You are, listen, you guys are not from the South. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Dan Cathy was the person who created Christian chicken. I mean, he sacrificed him. He baptized him in oil. He put him between the bread of life. And he served it to you. We call it Chick-fil-A. Dan Cathy 
in his retirement years, taught youth Sunday school faithfully every week. He was in church teaching youth Sunday school in his 80s, I think it was. Dan Cathy, I don't care what you think may be dead. I don't, think, I don't care what you think may be in the rear view of your life. God still has plans for you. And he has plans for me. And he has plans for every one of us. And I don't care what you think is dead. Don't give up on God. Because God can speak things into existence that you didn't even know existed. Romans 4.18, Paul continues in saying this. He writes, he says, in hope, he believed against hope. What the heck is that? Paul was drinking, I think, right here. We do, like Paul said to Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy, he says, hey, you know, Timothy, if your stomach gets a little upset, take a little wine, it'll help. Medicinally, it's all good. And so I think Paul had been having some stomach problems because in hope, in hope he believed against hope. Paul, what are you talking about? It doesn't even make sense. Did you, did you, do you understand the words that are coming out of your mouth? In hope he believed against hope. Such an odd statement. The Greek word for hope is el peace. Everybody, come on, let's together. Let's say it together. El peace. El peace. See, you learned some Greek today. So when you walk out of here, you can tell people that you learned something in church. You learned el peace. Okay. What does el peace mean? And, and I, I encourage you, you should go read the classical Greek literature on this. You should go read, because um, again, the New Testament's written in Greek. So Paul's using a Greek word. You should go read the Greek mythology because El Pis is really a Greek mythological character. It's the goddess of hope. So this is why Paul grabs this word, uses it in this moment that Abraham believed or he, he believed um, or he hoped. In hope, he believed against hope. And the interesting thing about it is, is in that, again, you should go read it and the story behind it with um, Pandora's box is kind of where that all comes from. You should read it. It's a fantastic understanding of the word El Peace. It'll give kind of some word picture behind all of this. But El Peace, basically, that word hope, it, it was literally double-sided. In the Greek, they didn't understand it the way we understand it. See, in the Greek, um, there was an expectation, expectation of a future positive or a future negative. See, we only look at the positive. When we use the word hope, we always talk about, well, there's hope. That means there's a future, a positive future ahead. There's a future possibility that is going to be positive in every way. But the Greeks would understand it both ways. That hope could mean it's a very positive thing, but they could also understand that in a negative way, as opposed, again, to our understanding. In other words, what he's saying is that in hope, Abraham believed against hope. That, in other words, this was a hopeless situation, humanly speaking. And that even though Abraham, when God told him that, listen, you're going to have, you and Sarah, y'all are going to have a baby at the age of 75 or later at some point, that Abraham said, well, that doesn't make any sense, God, but I believe you. I mean, have you, have you, have you wrestled your faith to the point where you're willing to go, God, this doesn't make sense, but I believe you. God, I don't, like, I don't like what you wrote right here, but I believe you. God, I don't like what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to go share my faith? Well, yeah. He says that in the Great Commission, he says that you, he says, here's our, here's our role. Go, every one of you, make disciples. How do you make a disciple? You start by sharing your faith. You have to lead someone to believing in Jesus, and then you help grow them and mature them. That's your calling. Not just mine, that's every one of our calling who say we are followers of Jesus Christ. So here it is, in other, he's saying in other words, in this hopeless situation, Abraham, that you're going to have a child. And Abraham was willing to believe what God said, and in in, no matter how hopeless it seemed, that I'm going to do that. And, you know, we've got some things in our world today that we're going to have to wrestle this to the ground. We're going to have to be like Abraham, in hope, believe against hope. That we're going to have to, in hope, in the hope of what God is, in the hope of who God is, in the hope of all that he's promised, that we are going to have to go, you know, what? in spite of what culture says, in spite of what everybody else is doing, and in spite of what people say is the right way to do things today, I'm just going to believe in the word of God. And I'm going to practice that, and I'm going to follow it, and I'm going to walk in it, and I'm going to step in it. And the reason I am is because I'm going to hope. In hope, I'm going to believe against hope. That in, that in this world that we say is hopeless, I don't believe it's hopeless. I mean, it feels like it at times, I'm sure, right? But it's not hopeless. As long as the church exists on earth and as long as the word of God is available to us, the world can change. 
but it requires me and you stepping out and sharing our faith and leading people to faith in Christ, inviting people to church. By the way, if you haven't invited anyone to church for Easter yet, you should do it. So how did Abraham and hope believe against his hopeless situation? What did he do? Did he just sit in his, hope, in his tent and go, God, I hope this works out. You, you, you work it all out. I'm just going to sit and do nothing. Is that what Abraham did? No. The type of belief that Abraham had is displayed in this, in hope. I, Abraham, believe that God is faithful and that if he said it, he'll do it. If he gave me the word, then I believe he's going to fulfill it. And since my hope is in him and he's telling me to do this and he's continuing, he's telling me to continue in my journey with him, that he's calling me to follow him, that he's leading me to places of righteousness, that he's leading me to places that are good, that my belief in him is so strongly in his word that I will continue to trust him. My belief is not intellectual, it's practical. My belief is not simply in the eternal, it is it is external. It is not just internal, it's external. That I'm going to show my faith. And therefore, in this seemingly hopeless situation, have you ever noticed the more you sit, the more hopeless you become? I was watching a movie one time. I can't even remember what the movie was. Guy's driving in the road, uh, or he's driving down the road, and it's, it's winter, it's night, it's dark. The, it's snowing like crazy. He's in a blizzard, and his car breaks down in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's no traffic. I mean, nobody's out. It's the blizzard is happening. And, and I remember in the movie, he kind of tries to keep the heater running as long as he can. And he bundles himself up in the backseat of his car, trying to stay warm until hopefully someone would drive by and rescue him. Can you imagine just having to sit in that moment? Like that's hopeless. And the longer you sit in doing nothing in the pursuit of anything, it's hopeless. But if you'll just keep moving forward, if you'll just keep following God as you go, guess what happens? Your hope is maintained because along the way, along the path, God is still speaking and God is still doing. And it says um, that Abraham believed God. He didn't believe in God. He believed that God. And the minute that we begin to believe because God said and that God will, then our hope is going to be restored as well. Verses 19 through 25, and we'll wrap up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Listen to what it says. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Can I ask you a question? What weakens your faith? What weakens your faith? <clears throat> Excuse me. Listen, um, is, is, and, and some of you in here, I know you just tremendous faith. But even Superman had kryptonite, right? What weakens your faith? See, for some of us, what will weaken our faith is, is this right here. <clears throat> well, wait a minute. How in the world can reading the Bible weaken our faith? Have you ever read a verse that you didn't like? You ever read a verse that just didn't make sense in, in how your life was being played out? Listen, we run up against verses all the time that we don't like. And it weakens our faith. Oh, I don't know if I can trust God. If God's asking me to give that up or if God's asking me to do this and follow him in this direction, that doesn't seem right because no one else is doing that and I don't feel like doing that. So therefore, my faith in God is weakened. For some of us, it's God's timing, right? I mean, don't you just wish, like we know God's promises. If you've read the Bible, you know that there's promises in here that are to everyone that, who would believe, who would follow, that God makes promises. Here's the problem. We, we believe God. And we believe his word is true, but sometimes what weakens our faith is the fact that when we, we speak, we read his word and then we speak about his promises, that his promises don't come true when we want them to come true and our faith is weakened. So what has your faith? So if, if you had to chart it today, 
your, your relationship with Jesus, your faith in Jesus? <clears throat> Would you say in the last year, two years, three years, is your faith trending up and to the right or down and to the right? I mean, does your faith look like your retirement fund? Everybody, can I get an amen? Like inflation ain't helping, right? Like all this stuff is not helping the retirement fund. Is, is your faith trending down or is it trending up? What has your meter, and, and, and if, it, if it is, if it's going down, if your faith has gone down in the last couple of years, why? What is it? What is that thing? Can you identify it? Maybe it's not that you have given up on God, but because his word hasn't been fulfilled in your life, in your timing, you have decided to take matters into your own hands. Have you ever done that? I have. Like God, since you ain't acting fast enough, I'm just going to do what I want to do. We all know how that works out. Not well. By the way, if, if you're being tempted to do that, you wouldn't be the only one. Listen, there, one of the things I love about the Bible is it's filled up with messed up people like me, right? I mean, Abraham. All right, so let's use Abraham. Since Paul's on Abraham, we're going to use Abraham here. And it's interesting because we just read all of these verses about how he never wavered in his faith and there was nothing that kept him from believing. And all. Do you know that in, at 75, he gets the promise. Ten years later, no child yet. So now he's 85. So it's like, well, now this is going to have to be tougher, God. I don't know. Like, I didn't think you could do it at 75, but I certainly don't believe you can do it at 85. At 85, and you can read this in Genesis 15, another God steps back in and he says, Abraham, calm down. I got this. Abraham, I promised, and I'm a promise maker, but I'm also a promise keeper. I am going to fulfill this. I mean, it's going to happen. And so Abraham's like, you're right, God. I don't know why I ever doubted. And, and God seals the promise with an oath. It's that story, if you remember, we talked about it before, where Abraham splits, to, uh, splits in half the animals and he walks between them as a, a symbol of signing an oath. It's kind of how kings did things back in the day. In the very next chapter, we just read about God sealing the deal with an oath. In the very next chapter, so that's 15, in, verse, in chapter 16 of Genesis, through his wife, they both begin to have some doubts. And, and here's what Sarah says. Sarah says, you know what? Maybe, and, and this is what we do when we get desperate for God to move. And then we don't get patient with his timing. Sarah says, Abraham, maybe, maybe, maybe what God meant. Now, they knew because he said through Sarah. Maybe he meant, maybe he was confused. Maybe he said, Sarah but he meant maybe my servant. So Abraham, here's what, here's what I need you to do, Abraham. How about if you slept with my servant and she bore us a child? And he does. One chapter after God just reaffirms. His, because God's timing wasn't his timing, Abraham's timing, he began to, his hope began to drain and then, Sarah comes up with a plan. Hey, I think this might work. And he's like, oh, you know what? That might work. And so he does. He goes and has a child with Hagar. And Hagar has a child and they name him Ishmael. If Abraham's not enough of an example, because you go, well, he's Old Testament. What about, what about the disciples in John chapter 6? In John chapter 6, here's what we find. The disciples had almost, even the disciples almost quit on Jesus. Did you know that? The disciples almost quit on Jesus. Here's what happened. The day after feeding the 5,000, which, which was a miracle, right? I mean, five loaves, two fish, 5,000 men plus women and children, so probably 15,000 people at least were fed by Jesus with five loaves of bread and two fish. The day after that miracle happens, here's what we see happening with the disciples. Now, I, I read the Bible kind of differently. I, I kind of picture these stories. I'm, I fill in gaps. Um, I try to read it a little more adventurous, if you will. And uh, so Jesus, in this moment, so think about this. So here's, here's Peter. We all know Peter was uh, known for speaking before he really processed everything, um, what he really should have thought. He should have kept his mouth, but he didn't. In this moment, Jesus says, he stands before the people and he says, I am the bread of life. 
Now, I can just imagine Peter, like Peter's like, oh, this is good. Like the bread of life. I, you know, I knew I made a great career decision when I left Jesus or left fishing and began to follow Jesus. This was a great career move. Because see, here's what's going to happen. Jesus is going to, he's going to ascend to the throne of heaven. He's going to become the king of Jerusalem. He's going to become the king of Israel. And I am going to be one of his top guys. I'm going to be high on the org chart. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to get this. And by the way, this whole bread of life thing, it's so marketable. We'll get, here's what we should do. And he probably, I could see him. He kind of gathers his disciples. I like that, what he just said. Let's write that down. Let's put that down. And hey, how about this? The bread of life. What if we baked bread and you guys made like some fish soup and we'll call it Palestine Bread Company, like Panera Bread Company? Went right over. And we'll sell this stuff and people will like show up and we can make lots of money. And then, then Jesus, he'll be king and we'll be wealthy and everything will be really good. And I can imagine Peter saying all that. And in, in, in the moment, maybe that Peter is thinking all of these things, like this is good. What he's saying, this is great teachings. Look at the crowds of people that are following. We got thousands of people. This movement started with just us. And now there's thousands of people following. And then all of a sudden something else comes out of Jesus' mouth. And here's what Here's what happens. He says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up on the last day. Can you imagine what Peter was thinking right then? Like, wait, 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 wait. Time out. Everybody, we're going to take a recess. Jesus hasn't eaten today. His blood sugar is a little low. He's, yeah, he's not right. We're going to get him something to eat. He'll come back out. He'll finish the sermon. Pull Jesus to the side and say, Jesus, what are you doing? The whole goal is to get people to follow. We're getting crowds. The thing is the movement's happening. It's like the Jesus revolution before the Jesus revolution, right? I mean, like it's happening. And Jesus is going to talk about eating flesh. Like slow down, Hannibal Lecter. I don't, we don't, I don't think people are going to go for this. Then you get to verse 67 of John chapter six and, here, and Jesus looks at the disciples and he said, so <clears throat> after he makes that bizarre statement, he looks at the 12, it says, do you wanna go away as well? Well, why would Jesus say that? Because Jesus knows the hearts of man. He knows the heart of every single person and he knew that the disciples in that moment were thinking about quitting. Why were they thinking about quitting? Hadn't they seen the miracles? Hasn't, haven't they seen all of the things that Jesus has done? Hasn't, haven't they heard a lot of his teachings? And the reason that they were thinking about quitting is because Jesus was doing something that they didn't understand. So where's your hope at? Sometimes God's not going to work in the way you think he's going to work. And sometimes he's certainly not going to show up when you think he's going to show up. And see, we lose, we lose hope in God when we underestimate the power of God to fulfill the promise of God. That's when we begin to lose hope. And, and so <clears throat> in verse 20, I love what Paul said. Verse 20 of Romans chapter 4, this is wrapping up. He says this, it says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. So then, what's the key then? What's the key for us? Not wavering in our hope, not wavering when things get a little rocky. We're not wavering when God doesn't show up when we expect him to show up in the way we want him to show up. What's the key? But he grew, he grew strong in the faith as he went. Do you know how you're going to make it? Do you know how you're going to live through your hopeless moments? You're going to continue to believe in God. And you're going you're to continue to give glory to God. You're going to continue to praise him. You're going to continue to worship him. You're going to continue to give him his glory because as you do, as you do, as you do, your faith is strengthened and you will not waver and your hope will be increased. 
because you believe something. You believe that God is a promise maker and God is a promise keeper. And I want to wrap up with this pool illustration. <clears throat> I told you several weeks ago in this series that um, I taught, we taught, like all of you probably got taught to swim. You know, your parents lovingly just shoved you into the pool, right? I told you the story about Asher. Asher wanted to swim so bad, but he, he would spend all of his time in the shallow end of the pool. Why? Because he can stand up there. He can stand up right there in the shallow end of the pool. But he so wanted to be in the deep end and swim around where his brothers were swimming. He so wanted to jump off the diving board and experience the full joy of what it means to be able to go swimming in a pool. But so I got in the pool. I told you the story. I got in the pool. So, all right, Asher, jump. I got you. There's a difference between believing in and believing that. That's what I shared with you a few weeks ago. Not believing in his dad, not believing that I'm his dad, but believing that I have the ability to keep him from drowning. And I, I have no plans for harm for him, but hope. And I want him to experience full joy. I want him to love the pool like everybody else is loving the pool. See, the water can, water look like so much fun. And for some of you, life looked like so much fun. Your relationship with Jesus looked like so much fun. When it began, you were so full of hope. You were so excited about your journey. You started telling people that you didn't even know about your baptism and about how you accepted Jesus by faith. And you're telling people everywhere. And they, you walked away and they went, who is that weird girl? But you told everybody because there was so much joy in it. And, and just like with Asher, he had so much joy in wanting to be in that pool but all he could ever enjoy was the shallow end. What once caused Asher fear, what once caused him fear to jump in, now causes him to jump in, not just in the deep places, but to jump in when it's even uncomfortable. A couple years ago in January, it was like 15 degrees outside and they jumped in the pool. I'm like, you guys are dumb. There were some boys sitting in this audience that jumped in my pool yesterday, and it's still cold. I'm not getting in until it's like 80 degrees in the pool, right? But you know what happens when you have joy in that? When you have joy in God, when you have joy in your faith, when you have joy in the journey, when you so love what God has promised to you, even if you haven't gotten it yet, you're totally okay with getting out of the shallow end of your faith and jumping into the deep end of the pool and following Jesus wherever he says, and you'll even do it when it's uncomfortable because you love it. When was the last time? When was the last time you did anything uncomfortable? When was the last time you felt hope in your heart because of your faith in Christ? It's the most beautiful journey of my life. I love my wife with all of my heart, but my wife knows she comes in second to Jesus and she would have it no other way. Because when my life, when my love for her is preeminent, when it is first, when it is foremost, when it is right, then I can love her rightly. But if he's not first, then I can't love her the way that I need to live. When was the last time, when was the last time you had just unbelievable joy in your heart over your relationship with Jesus? When was the last time your hope in your heart was so full that when we sang songs, you shouted so loud that you hurt the ear of the people in front of you? He grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, as he gave glory. And I pray that this week you would just begin, even if it doesn't feel comfortable, even if it isn't easy, even if it scares you just a little bit, It's okay to pee in the pool. Not really. <laughs> Even if it scares you just a little bit, that's where God wants you. Growth doesn't happen in comfort zones, but your joy will be made full when you get uncomfortable and you step out by faith and you just, man, do the biggest cannonball into your faith journey that you can do. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus is the savior of your life, it begins there. You don't have to fully understand it to step into it. I know Abraham didn't know where he was going and what was going to be the end of it. 